a desire for a global education led Mike Cooney and his family to give up everything to travel the world. I'll talk with him about the importance of educational travel and what his journeys have taught him next on Metro Center Outlook. Hello everyone, welcome to Metro Center Outlook. I'm Diane Trees, director of the UCF Metro Center and your host for Metro Center Outlook. At the start of the economic collapse, Mike Cooney, a business consultant, sold his house and all of his possessions to embark on a worldwide adventure with his wife and three teenage sons. Now he's sharing his love for travel with others as a co-owner of the travel agency Cooney World Adventures. Mike joins me today to talk about his life, his travels, and his advice for people who want to pursue their passion. But first, let's take a look at how Central Florida welcomes adventurers like Mike and other travelers into the United States. Nearly four million of the tourists visiting Central Florida each year, like this lot landing in Sanford from London, are international travelers. While a big majority come from Canada, England, and Western Europe, where English is widely spoken, efforts to make the others feel welcome go well beyond the greeting sign at OIA and actually begin before the travelers arrive. The web pages for both airports with regular international arrivals are multilingual. How about in the real world? The airport has uniformed ambassadors these days uh, that are multilingual. Uh, you then go to your car rental and your GPS is in several languages these days. You arrive at your hotel, the front desk folks uh, will speak Spanish, they'll speak Portuguese, they'll speak several languages. Bienvenue and marhaba. The theme parks and attractions, large and small, have long catered to foreign travelers. Several hotels have begun printing their menus in various languages and offering culturally important services such as free breakfasts. There are plenty of restaurants catering to ethnic tastes along with traditional American fare. And for some, there is now a new taste of home. Brazilian tourists can find a well-known hometown chain of their own along I Drive. International visits have been increasing since a recession-connected drop in 2009, and experts expect this trend to continue as new markets in the Mideast and China discover Orlando. Visit Orlando's Santos says the area is ready. We saw several Arabic families in full garb um, walking around the mall, but nobody by a bat an eyelash. I think we're, we're ready in this community for that. Our DNA in Orlando is hospitality. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, Diane. You had a successful career here in Central Florida before deciding on this grand adventure. How did that idea for the travel, how did that come about? My wife and I had always talked about, even before we had kids, that one day we wanted to take our children to see the world. And it was one of those great ideas, but just never seemed like things would come together. And ironically, it was in 2008, August 18th to be exact, uh, excuse me, 2005, August 18th of 2005, that we received a, an appraisal on our home and saw we had all this equity. And that's when we turned to each other and said, wow, I think we can do this now. And literally that day we made the decision that we would sell everything we own and take our three sons on an around the world trip. But we wanted to wait until 2008 before we actually left. And of course, as a result, the real estate market went into a free fall and all of that equity went away, but we still made it work. So it was really something that we had always talked about, and then we found what we thought were the resources to do it and decided to act upon it, and we worked literally for three years from that point we made the decision until the day we left, which was almost exactly three years to the day. It took a lot of courage to sell your house, your cars, your boat. How did you know, though, that you were making the right decision for not only you, but for the family to, to make this trip? It was something we certainly questioned ourselves often, but something just said it was the right thing to do. And the luxury and the beauty that we had is that my wife and I were on the same page from the get-go. If it weren't for that, it never could have happened because so many times you hear of, well, one wants to do it and one doesn't or this or that, and it was never a doubt. It was always that we wanted to do it and we wanted to do it together and we wanted to do it with our three sons in mind to give them this opportunity to see the world before they started college. 
So from that standpoint, it was never a question, even though it was at times a little scary, and we certainly had plenty of highs and lows, days that we were ready to give up and say, forget it. Fortunately, we never felt that way on the same day. <laughs> Usually one would, I, I was always the one who was ready to, to be the jumper, as we called it, and my wife would always bring me back and say, nope, we can do this, I know we can do it. And then there would be every now and then a day when she was questioning, and I said, nope, we can do this, so. Now, were the boys as enthusiastic? Did they buy into this right away? The twins did immediately, because they had heard me talk about my travels and the places I had been to in the world, and they'd always come to me and say, Dad, when are we going to go to Machu Picchu? When are we gonna to go to wherever it may be that I had been previously? And I would always say, I don't know, which was a really lousy answer. So from their standpoint, they were ready to go. Our youngest, Harrison, who at the time was 13 when we made the decision, was far less enthusiastic. He was very social, was going to Conway Middle School, had a circle of friends. And I think the turning point came when we said, okay, that's fine, you don't wanna go with us, then we'll just go without you. And by the way, you're gonna to have to go to North Florida and spend time with your grandparents and go to the high school there. That was the turning point when he said, I think we'll That was the decision all. for that. <laughs> well, you wanted your sons to be global citizens before they went to college. Why was that so important? Just simply seeing the, the people around us, both in their own age groups as well as others, it was really important because of my own experience in travel and the difference it's made in my life that without that experience, I, I don't think I would have a greater appreciation for the things that I do, and that there are other people in other countries doing far different things than we would normally do. And we just wanted them to have that experience for their own sake of mind to say, okay, I see it, I've been out there, as opposed to people who might read about it in books, watch TV, look at different TV shows. We wanted them to have that on a personal level and then whatever choices they made beyond that were fine. But to, to prophesize about what the rest of the world is like without actually having seen it was just not the way we wanted them to have that experience. What about friends and family here when you told them you were getting rid of all your possessions, stopping the business and taking this trip. What was reaction? Were they supportive or? My, my parents were because they knew that I traveled a great deal previously and they were fine with it. And they thought that if that was what we wanted to do with our kids, then that was the thing that we should do. My wife's parents were supportive, but I think they thought it was a passing thing, that it really wasn't going to happen. They were a little more, um, I think, reluctant as time got closer and they could see not only were we serious, we were making very, very uh, hard plans to make it happen. Uh, but at the end of the day, they were very, very supportive. They took us to the airport and thank goodness for Skype because in some cases, I think we talked to them more when we were in other parts of the world than when we were just down the road three hours. Right. So. What about your, uh, what shaped your traveling? You mentioned before that you had had a background with that. How did that begin? It began ironically when I was going to a community college up in North Florida and I received a call very early one morning from uh, a relative who was a chief engineer on a ship in the Merchant Marine and said, how would you like a chance to go to Egypt and earn 80 bucks a day? That was in 1978 dollars. Today that would be about three or four hundred dollars a day. And it took me a couple of minutes, but I decided, okay, I think I'll do that. So I literally worked on and off for two years on this rust bucket of a ship that should have probably been scrapped many, many years earlier, and traveled as well as uh, backpacked in Europe for three months on the summer of 1979. And that is really what got me going. And then from there, just on business trips, and of course, as you know from my previous experience with the Metro Orlando EDC, I was the executive director of the Metro Orlando International Affairs Commission, so we were welcoming delegations and taking business trips abroad. And, and it was just something that international was just, it was just my life. In fact, ironically, if you ask my wife or I, name any place we would want to travel, it would have an international destination. Even though there's many great places to go in the U.S., we just default to international. Well, you've said that travel is the ultimate education. So what does getting out and about in the world, what does that teach you? I, I wrote a press release when we were out and about and sent it out, and the title of it was um, Teaching Our Children for the 21st Education. Uh, because the fact is that 
so many kids in this day and age, and it's not just in the U.S., I want to make that perfectly clear. We certainly saw this in other parts of the world where all kids were doing were texting or on their phones or doing things. It, it, it just was one of those things where we felt that getting out there and seeing it firsthand and not necessarily getting everything from a book would, would really be the way people learn and understand and appreciate other cultures and people and destinations. So from that standpoint, and I still believe it and we still believe it, the travel truly is the ultimate education. That there's only so much you can get from a textbook or something from the uh, internet and just the interaction. We still have friends, our, our kids are on Skype with people they met in Brazil of their own age. Uh, we have contacts in Vietnam that never would have happened without that personal contact first. This is a grand adventure that you had, but there's also some very practical considerations like the boys schooling. Just how did you manage expenses as you moved along? How did you cope with these things? My wife had been homeschooling the three boys, which is another reason why we wanted to wait until 2008, because the plan was that with her homeschooling them through Florida Virtual School, that the twins could finish up their 12th grade year before we left, and that Harrison would work ahead a year so that then he would essentially have a year off. And that was another reason for waiting the additional three years. So the schooling was taken care of before we left. Obviously, when we got back, Harrison then uh, enrolled as a, as a dual enrollment student and was taking classes at the community college. Uh, but nevertheless, that portion of the education was more or less taken care of before we left. As far as the, the budgeting, if you will, uh, it was as simple as Cottrell and I going to the library and bookstores and going through Lonely Planet and estimating about how much per day we thought we would spend. And it, it was really bizarre because being a project manager, being somebody who manages things like that all the time, within 24 hours of making our decision, I had already started spreadsheets and knowing exactly where we were going to go, how we were going to do it. During our entire trip, I had spreadsheets that I was keeping track of our budget. So it was just kind of second nature to me. But the ironic thing is that when we left on the first leg of our two-leg trip, we had estimated about $200 a day. When we returned over a year later, six continents, 22 countries, more than 61,000 miles, it was almost exactly on $200 a day. So you really were For all five very of accurate us. on right. that. Oh. That was all five of us, not including airfare, which was separate. But that was just our, our living expenses, our travel expenses, those kinds of things. So again, good planning, three years of it to be exact. Well, I know off. you had um, sponsors, but was were they part from the beginning, or did that evolve as you went along because what you were doing was such a good fit? We had the idea early on and weren't sure exactly whether that would materialize or not, of course. And we saw the value of it, but in the economy at the time, whether anybody else would. We had also considered, and I did, I reached out to a number of large national companies, but of course, you know, it was pretty much, no, sorry, not interested. And one day I was headed to Altamont Springs and said, why don't I stop in and see the folks at Travel Country? Locally owned, uh, family owned, and quite honestly, I walked in, I asked for the owner, Mike Plant, and I just gave him the pitch on the floor. And he said, what a great idea. And from there, he then said, uh, contact my marketing guy, and they supplied all of our gear for the entire trip, which was quite substantial, which was just fantastic. And in exchange, we wrote blogs, and we talked about their products and did reviews and so forth. Another good friend of mine had a language school here in Orlando. Again, I gave him the pitch, and they put together a language class for all five of us, a Spanish language class, at no charge, again, in exchange for the recognition. And then through travel country, I was put in touch with Chaco Shoes, and Chaco gave us all of our footwear. Uh, there were probably more opportunities out there, but it just got to the point where it was took a lot of time to try to manage it. So, How did you decide which countries you were going to go to? Was like the language class, did that sort of influence it, it where you did went? did because we knew we were going to spend about four months in Central and South America. Initially, when we thought we were going to have lots of money, we were going through Europe and then down through Africa and cross that way. And really not go to Central and South America. But when we got to running the numbers again, especially realizing we were going to have far less in the way of resources than we thought, we decided to forego Europe 
and instead go Central and South America, which is why then we took the Spanish language class. So yes, that did definitely have something to do with it. How important is the journey, the process of actually getting to the destination? Is it as critical as reaching the destination? It's probably even more so because of the richness of the experience. We backpacked and we did not stay in luxury hotels. Some of the places, in fact, I. I refer to them affectionately now as I look back as the Bates Motel franchises <laughs> worldwide because I can tell you there are places we stay that even I don't know why or how we stayed there. But we stayed in some very nice places, we camped, we did virtually all of it. And, and as far as being able to choose those countries that you mentioned, it was really just looking at a map. And, and how we did it was Cottrell and I would sit down and, and we also when we planned out our around the world tickets. We had no timeline except to be in a certain airport in a certain country to leave. Otherwise, the time between those two points was our own. So when we first landed in Mexico, we didn't fly again until Costa Rica. And then all of that distance was by bus. And then the same went for South America. And then it was slightly different on the second leg of our trip, which included two months in Southern Africa, two months in Southeast Asia, two months in Australia, two weeks in New Zealand, and 10 days in Fiji. That was kind of a, a, a mishmash of, of travel and how to get from point A to point B. Now travel, food, um, they all influence each other. What made, what experience made the biggest impact for you on this trip? Well, you mentioned food. First of all, when we were taking our Spanish language class, the young woman who was our instructor, who was from Colombia, we told her that we were vegan and vegetarian and that we would not be consuming any kind of animal products as we traveled through Central and South America. And she said, flat out, no way, no how, you can't do it. And we actually proved just the opposite, which is why my wife created the Wandering Coconut, was to prove on her website that, in fact, people can travel, regardless of whatever their dietary restrictions might be. So those were the kind of things that we had to overcome. And going into it, we honestly didn't know if it could happen or not. But we were all committed. And as a result, those are the kinds of things that we heard prior to leaving that were a little scary because we didn't know if maybe that was possible or not. But I think it's, it's like with anything. If you have the commitment, if you have the drive, then you'll just make it work. And it, it's every place we went, people say, well, what is your favorite? And every one of us, all five of us in the family say, it depends. There is no one place that you could say has it all. If you like surfing, you want to go here. If you like eating, you want to go there. If you want scenery, you go here. So that's kind of how, how we respond to those kinds of questions. What was the strangest thing you saw? That's an interesting question, and probably the answer I'm going to give is not what most people would think. And I actually consulted my wife this morning, and I said, look, I'm going to get asked this question, and this is what comes to mind. And I told her, and she said, you know, I think that's the one. And what, I, what probably people would think of is some bizarre, weird kind of thing. Well, to be honest, you see a lot of that on National Geographic, and we saw it too. You know, five people on a moped with a stack of chickens behind them that's pretty strange. But on the other hand, people see it. We both agreed that although as mundane as it sounds, it was one of those things that just caught us completely off guard. We were in Canto, Vietnam, and there was a coffee shop right next to the hotel we were staying. So we hadn't had good coffee in ages, and we thought, wow, this is finally a chance to get some good coffee. So we went into the coffee shop, and we said we'd like two cups of coffee. And when they presented it to us, I think we just sat there and stared at it. There was a glass cup with what looked like espresso, hot. There was a boiling cup of water, and there was milk. And there were three separate glasses with no handle. And we just looked at it and <laughs> said, now what do we do? <laughs> and we took pictures of it and blogged about it. And just, it was such a bizarre thing that you go into a coffee shop, regardless of the country, you think you're gonna get coffee in a coffee cup. And out comes this put-together kit that was just so out of character for the situation. Just has different meanings for you. Yeah, it does. It really does. Well, you came back and you started your travel agency, mm -hmm. Cooney World Adventures. Now, was that in the back of your mind all along, or was that sort of something that developed? It developed because naively we thought we could parlay our entire trip into something that would last beyond it from a, a, um, a vocational standpoint, you know, income. That is, 
as a result of this, somebody would want to pick us up and do a TV show or would do something. Well, th you know, that didn't happen. But at the same time, when we got back, people were asking us, where did you go? What did you like? What would you do, et cetera? So it was really coming from that that we said, why not? And since I do consulting already, it just became a natural progression from helping people decide on where to go and giving them feedback on the things that they should do while they're there because you know if you're more adventuresome I mean that's really what we like is the adventure travel and that's what we like to sell although we can do whatever but the adventure travel is at a different level that most people when they ex they really go there for the experience and they want to get as much as they can while they're there what advice do you give to people who asked about taking a trip like you did do the rewards outweigh the hassles without a question Ultimately, because the real estate market was so bad, I had to cash into my retirement to make this happen. Uh, many people look at that and say, you know, what were you thinking? And we would do it again tomorrow. No questions asked because, again, in our opinion, the reward was so much greater and that we see it every day in our three sons. The twins, not long after we got back, uh, took off from community college and were in Costa Rica for three months. And they were surfing, they were helping catch and relocate crocodiles, they were learning how to handle venomous snakes. Uh, that was their experience. They just got back, Morgan and Zach, from five months in South Africa where they helped protect rhinos, did counter poaching work, uh, they did a field guide course in Botswana where the objective of the class that day was to get as close to dangerous animals as possible. Most parents would look at that and say, maybe we didn't teach our kids such a great thing. We look at it as, yes, we did, and now, many people agree with us. That's Cooney Wildlife Adventures. Is that Morgan and Zach? That's their website as well, yes. What, what do you tell people that they need to know before they head out on some international venture? Planning is key. It really is. Certainly if you choose to work with a travel agent who has that experience, then maybe you don't have to plan quite as much. But for something as, as grandiose as what we did that was as complicated as it was with the itinerary and movement and so forth throughout the different places, planning is really, really the most important thing. And planning financially a little better than maybe we did. That you would, my goal would be one day to see where We'd even have a foundation that would essentially help people make this a long-term goal, that they start saving when their kids are in preschool, just as if it was a college fund, and that they make this their goal when they're much older. We chose to take our kids when they were in their teens. A lot of people travel the world with much younger children, and that's great if it works for them. But we wanted ours to walk away with the experience and they would remember it and be something that they would actually take away. Harrison, for example, the youngest is now 19 and, and he's pursuing photography because that's his passion. And again, we think that that was largely uh, developed his eye for photography as we were traveling. Now you've traveled all over the world. You've seen different cultures, different people. Is there anything though that you've discovered that people have in common no matter where they live? We saw, whether it was in some of the poorest areas of Vietnam or a metropolis like Santiago, Chile, that by and large, people just simply want to be able to be with their family, to have a good life, and, and not to be hassled, if you will. Unfortunately, various reasons, whether they be political or otherwise, perhaps don't allow that to happen. But but overall, there is, there's just sort of one core that we saw everywhere we went, whether it was in a very poor Mayan village in the jungles of Guatemala, where they didn't care about the price of oil or housing markets or the stock market. And when we went into their school and we asked those kids, where would you most like to go? They said, right here in our own village. That's wonderful. And that was pretty amazing. Mike, thank you so much for being on the show, and good to see you again. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I've been talking with Mike Cooney, the co-owner of Cooney World Adventures, about his travels and his business. Thank you for tuning in to Metro Center Outlook. Until next time, I'm Diane Trees.